aqui agora com vocês um dos coprodutores do Call of Duty, Chess Glasgow, que estava hoje vendo o jogo no Brasil com a gente. Brasil! Obrigado. Fala galera! É, meu nome é Chance Blasco, eu sou uh, cofundador de Doghead Simulations e Amazon Trash Call of Duty. Uh, eu morava no Rio há um ano, mais ou menos, então eu falo um pouco português, mas eu não falo inglês porque quando eu falo português eu pareço uma criança. Então, <laughs> English is ok? Alright, we have a translator anyway, so we should not complain. Alright, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what inspired me to work in games, the games that I play. Um, and uh, my first, uh, going to university, studying animation, starting my own video game company, uh, Infinity Ward, and then eventually what I'm doing now is working in virtual reality. So let's start off in the year 1980. The year 1980 is the year that I was born, right? And this is the kind of game we had in 1980 on a PC. It was called Zork, and it was basically an interactive book. It was a lot of text, a lot of reading, and you solve puzzles, and you basically talk to the computer, and you try to do things. Anyone here ever played Zork? It's probably maybe one or two people know. That's okay, I'm going to know you guys pretty much. Uh, so let's see, 1983, all right. King's Quest. Has anyone here played a King's Quest game? No? Okay, we'll get there eventually, maybe in 1990 or so. Um, so 1983, same kind of game. We had an adventure game uh, where it's a lot of, you know, typing to solve puzzles, but now you have graphics, if you want to call it graphics, because you had four colors, right? We'll do four color graphics uh, from a 16 color hardware palette, and, and you didn't have square pixels, you know, the, the pixels were not even square, so kind of graphics, right? 1988, five years later, this was the game, the first PC adventure game that I ever played, and we can see the graphics are finally getting better. We now have uh, 16 colors, so so beautiful, right? Uh, we now have, no, still not square pixels, still rectangle pixels, but the graphics are getting there, it's looking a little nicer. Okay, 1989, even better, right? So in 1989, uh, my best friend called me on the phone after school. I was in fourth grade. And he said, Chance, I've got this great, amazing game called Quest for Glory, or actually at the time it was called Hero's Quest. They had to change the name later. Called Hero's Quest, and it's like King's Quest, but it's also an RPG. It's also a role-playing game. And so to me, it sounded like an amazing game, so I went to his house, and I would stay there, I think, five hours the first day to play it. And then every day after school, I would go to his house so he could play this game. It was the game that convinced me that PC gaming was a lot different than gaming on a Nintendo, and a lot more powerful. So a little more, uh, 1992, we now have 256 colors. Things are getting a little nicer. You know, it's something you want to look at. Um, we now have, let me see, squares? Yes, one-to-one, -one, square pixels. We figured out squares, so how amazing. So, around 1991, I begged my parents for a computer. I was using my friend's computer at his house, but there's a problem. In 1991, a PC computer was about 3,000 US dollars. And that's about 6,000 US dollars today, which is about, what, 22,000 PIs, after it posted those, like 40,000 PIs. It was like, it was like buying a car, right? Um, but luckily, I convinced them that they're investing in my education. I just wanted to play games, right? So, um, let me see. So here's some games I started playing, but I got a little sick of just playing games. I was inspired by these games, and I wanted to make them. And I didn't have any resources to learn programming. The library didn't have any books on programming. But I found this language in my computer, and it was called BASIC. And BASIC was a basic programming language, where you have all these lines, these numbers, and you might say, okay, if the person inputs S, then go to line 150, and then execute that line. Very simple. And I found these games here, written in this language, and so I started reverse engineering, trying to learn how to program by looking at the game and looking at the code. 
It's kind of like uh, trying to learn Mandarin Chinese when you don't have any Chinese friends. You know, it's not a, a very easy thing to do. And so after a little bit of learning, I made my first text adventure game that Dennis Zhu took over Compton. It was a 1990s gangster rap text adventure game, the best 1990s gangster rap game that ever existed. I think three people played it, and they're all my friends. Um, and so I realized that after making this horrible text adventure game with Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, that I need to get a real education and actually uh, learn how to make games that people want to play. And so I was living in Melbourne, Florida, which if you guys have been to Orlando, I'm sure at least half of you have. Um, it's uh, about an hour away from where I was living. And I checked out the school, Full Sail University, and I decided to study computer animation. And so this school was a little different. It was, you know, about 40 hours a week of school, and then homework, 55 hours. It was a full-time job. And so I got a degree in only 15 months uh, in computer animation. And I decided I want to move out to Los Angeles. Because Los Angeles has the highest concentration of, game, of uh, jobs in, in animation, in video games, in, in everything entertainment, right? That's where you can find the most jobs. So I got my 1988 Honda Accord, and I drove all the way from Orlando, Florida to Los Angeles, right? And just so you know, driving from uh, Orlando to Los Angeles is the same distance driving from Porto Alegre to Acre on a capybara. This is my preferred method of transportation here in Brazil. You can find mine parked outside. And so just so you know, I got to Los Angeles and I didn't have a place to live for most of it, so I actually would park my car outside of a gold's gym, right? Because at a gym, you have showers, you have bathrooms. And so I could sleep in the back of my car, put towels in the windows to block the uh, street lights. Um, and the next morning, I would get up, I would go to the gym, I'd shower and go look for a job. Because if you don't shower, it's hard to find a job. So, I drove, I didn't find any work after a month, a horrible time, right? A horrible month, my dreams were crushed and I drove all the way back. I was going to drive back to Florida, but I stopped in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And just, Tulsa, Oklahoma is not exactly where you expect to find a game job, right? Much like Akri, there's not a lot of game developers there, right? Um, and so I stopped at this company in 2015, and they gave me an internship, and I worked for free for uh, three days, right? Is that a laser? Is that a laser on here? Let me see. Uh, yeah, we can't really see it. All right, so you see it right here on the bottom right. Uh, everyone was taking pictures with this monkey I had for some reason. We were a small team, um, I think about 30 people at the time. And so after a month of interning, um, they decided they wanted to hire me because we had E3 coming up. And you guys probably know E3, it's like Brazil game show, uh, but for the United States and Canada. Um, and so I made this, I worked on this first level. I'm going to keep talking over the audio so you can have a little bit of video audio. Okay, thank you. So as you can see here, um, this was the first level, first professional game level I ever worked on. Has anyone here played Medal of Honor Allied Assault? Ah, finally, someone's played my games. <laughs> I was feeling lonely for a while. Um, so yeah, I had really simple tasks. I would take one animation of guys holding one gun, like this one right here is the M1 brand, they hold it like this. But the Germans have different guns that you might hold like this, right? And so I'd have to take the animation, take the hand, and actually place it on a different location and then re-export that animation. So I wasn't really even animating. Um, so you can actually see after this opens here, when you go on the beach, you'll see some guys on the ground that are dying, they're like oh, shaking and whatnot. I did those animations too, so those were my first professional game animations. So we went to E3, and this was before the internet was the main source of information for games. When you go to E3, you go see a game, and then if it's cool, you tell a friend, and that friend tells a friend, and then the word gets around, and before you know it, there's a three, yeah, three-hour line outside of your theater to uh, watch your game. It's won all kinds of awards, so many different awards uh, for E3. 
and uh, went back, and it seemed like everything was good. You know, uh, we uh, finished the game, I think, eight months later. Um, but we had a problem. Uh, even after the launch, we had a very successful game. It was a surprise hit, highest rated Medal of Honor ever. But we did not like the person we worked for, right? It's very important to like your boss. So as a result, 22 of the 30 people in that company, we just left. We said, forget it, we'll work for this guy more. Um, let's go start a new company. And so this is in seven designers, four engineers, three animators, three artists, one IT, and four business in production. And this was me right here, kind of the early Justin Bieber haircuts. Um, I was 19 or 20 years old. And we had, this is three animators right here, right? And so most of these people, like half of them work at Respawn on Titanfall, the new Star Wars game. The other half are different places. Um, and so we started in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We moved to Los Angeles. Um, and we had to create a game working with Activision, because we left Electronic Arts, working with Activision that would compete with Medal of Honor. And Medal of Honor was just one of the highest rated first person shooters ever, so how are we going to do this? We have to start all over because we don't own Medal of Honor. So we start all over and created a game. We called it Call of Duty. Has anyone played the very first Call of Duty for PC? Awesome, even more hands. Uh, my mic's cutting out a little. If you guys want to give me a handheld, I will use it. It's okay if the mic causes problems. Uh, so we have finished this game in 15 months and we had to start over. Even though we had worked on World War II game already, uh, we had to start over because we didn't own the code. And so we got the Quake 3 engine again, and we rewrote a lot of the same things, but we did it better, because we knew where our mistakes were in the last game, and we were able to make a more efficient game, and we had the freedom to uh, make the choices as a, as a developer that you want to make. Uh, our previous publisher would not uh, actually give us freedom as Activision did. So as a result, Call of Duty was actually a higher rated game than Medal of Honor. We had a problem though, we were only on PC. Uh, and so luckily after the launch of Call of Duty, Microsoft called us and they said, hey, we love Call of Duty, but we want to play it on our new console, the Xbox 360. So we said, yes, we'd love to be on your new console. We developed Call of Duty 2, launched on Xbox 360 and PC. Um, and I think for the, in the first year, it was like 70% it was like 70% of the people who had bought an X, uh, Xbox 360 had actually bought our game. I'm going to remove this real quick, guys. Give me one second. Thank you for your patience. All right, so this is me. You can see me right here. I was a British soldier, so sometimes I'd be playing the game, and I look over and I see myself get shot in the head, dying, and like over and over. It's kind of weird. I used to have dreams. I worked on World War II games for so long. I would have dreams. I was in World War II, and like I was only American like 70% of the time, 30% of the time. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> you know. Um, so, what happens when you work on World War II games for a long time? We worked on World War II games for longer than America was actually in World War II. Um, so you can see you'd be sick of it. Um, so, we had all these great ideas, like what about helicopters? Those are cool. Those weren't World War II. What about, you know, uh, all these new, like AK-47 didn't have that. All these close quarter tactics. All these things we couldn't do in World War II. So we went to um, Activision, right? And we said, we've got a great idea. How about Call of Duty, except modern day? I'm like, of course we're going to like it. Like, uh, no, look here, the charts, see the sales, World War II, World War II, money, 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 money. As creative people, you don't, you can't follow the money. you got to follow what you're excited about, right? And so that's what happens with uh, publishers and developers is it's like if you are um, a band and you make a, a, a new CD, like a new album, and it sells, you know, five million copies, your record label says, do the same music again, but a little different, right? Same thing with games. That's why you see all these big games, Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, you know, all these AAA titles, they don't change very much because there's too much money in them. I'm getting off topic. I'm going to go on my rant against AAA gaming. All right, so what we did is we actually told them about this, and they said no. And our publisher, or sorry, um, 
Jason and Vince, the heads of our company, they were told no by Activision, and they came back to our studio and they say, Activision said no to modern Call of Duty, but we said, what if we make a prototype for a modern Call of Duty anyways, we just lock our doors for two or three months, we don't let Activision into our studio, and we surprise them, like, hey, look what we did. And we did that. We basically, we told them we were doing World War II, and we did Modern Warfare. We kept them out of our studio for three months. It was amazing. Never do this. You'll lose your financing. So, um, this is from the remastered version. Has anyone here played Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare? Nice, that's like most of you guys. Sweet. This was my favorite game I ever worked on. It was so refreshing to work on something new. Um, as an animator, my job specifically was working with the first person animation. So the gun in front of you, the reloads, right? Anything that you see from the shoulders down to the gun, I was doing animations. And if you look at early first person shooters like Rainbow Six, like the early Rainbow Six, they didn't even have a model for the gun or the hands. It was just it was just like a little icon of what gun you have and then your crosshair. And that's horrible because in a first person shooter, who's the main character? It's you, right? Not only is it you, it's really just your arms and your fingers and your gun, right? That's all you're going to see. Um, and so it's very important as a first-person weapons animator to add a lot of character in those animations. So I would go to the gun range and I'd actually get a hold of these weapons. And I would set up targets, you know, we would get uh, sides of, of beef and like glass and wood. We'd set up microphones for all the audio guys. And I would shoot the guns, I would, I would learn how to operate them and I would find the unique characteristics on every single weapon so that they all feel different. Because if you know anything about guns, there's really just two ways to, re to reload a gun. There's pretty much guns function one of two ways, so it's sometimes hard to make every weapon feel a lot different. If you see uh, Kriegler on that shipping crate, that was our art director. We have a lot of little secret things in the game, names that are like people from our studio. Uh, does anyone here train jujitsu? Jujitsu, awesome. So um, on the side of the spots 12, it says JB, uh, uh, GB72 BJJ, which is Gracie Baja Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And so I put a little Gracie Baja secret in there for my homies. Are you Gracie Baja? <laughs> no, right. So I put a little secret in there for my uh, friends from the gym. So this was the first game that we actually did motion capture for the, for the characters. Uh, before, we would actually just do everything by hand. The first person animations were always done by hand. So actually, I don't know if we'll get to the end here, but at the very end, uh, there's an explosion and you see a guy get thrown back. And that was actually me being motion captured. Let me see if we're... Yeah, I'll just skip to it. You'll see the motion capture later. So, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, um, my favorite game I ever worked on. Huge, a huge success by far, you know, I think doubled the sales of Call of Duty 2. And it put us up there with Grand Theft Auto, with Halo, with the biggest of the AAA titles. Uh, so where do you go when you're as big as Halo or Grand Theft Auto, you know, one of the biggest gaming titles? Well, after that, really the only way up is to be one of the biggest entertainment titles. So when we launched uh, Call of Duty, uh, sorry, uh, Modern Warfare 2, um, we actually beat the sales of Avatar at the box office, like Avatar the movie. And so n now we were up there with Avatar, with you know, Star Wars, all these huge entertainment franchises that had sold billions and billions of dollars worth. But what happened before? I got sick of things, right? Did another Modern Warfare 3, but then I was like, yeah, you know, more of the same. I'm sorry if you played Call of Duty Ghosts. I apologize. <laughs> the dog was great. You know, you know, we, we did motion capture on the dog, we put him in a spandex and tights, and he's like walking like this. Like, that's not how a dog walks, dog. Come on, walk correctly. So, let me see what we got here. Oh yeah, so here's, uh, before we did motion capture, we had chance capture. We have to hit play on this one, bottom left. So this is before we did motion capture, how we had reference for our animations.
is what I call to be one of the sober in this guy. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. And then we decided to switch to motion capture. So of course they're like, Chance, you should be the motion capture actor. That's a great idea, guys. If you stop at the right frame, my head is like 70 degrees tilted. I had a sore neck for three weeks, and then we hired a Brad Pitt stunt double to replace me, because he was a professional. And uh, Activision did not want to get sued by me. So what happens after 14 years of first-person shooters, 12 years of Call of Duty, over 100 weapons animated, two company splits, it's time to travel. Where does every game developer go when they get burned out? Brazil, of course, right? Uh, so I lived in Gloria. Any, any karaokas here? Karaokas? No, they're all the Boteco? Okay. Uh, yeah, so it was a wonderful experience. I lived here for about a year just to recover from too much Call of Duty, too much game industry. Um, you know, made a lot of great friends. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've spent in Brazil probably almost two years total if you count all my time here. Um, so my current company, this right here, Gog and Simulations, was actually started because of horrible Rio internet. You know, I got like three megabits download and I'm like, we can't even video conference, we gotta fix this. So, what are the benefits of remote collaboration, right? Well, you can save money on traveling. Um, smaller carbon footprint basically just means less pollution, right? If you travel a lot, you're creating pollution. You can live a healthier lifestyle. If you're a software developer or game developer here, you know you spend like maybe 50, 60, maybe more hours sitting at a computer. It's not good for you for a long time. You can't do that in your whole life. If you're a, a programmer or someone that sits at a computer all the time, find some kind of exercise you like, because later in life you will pay, you'll hate life if you don't take care of yourself. So let's uh, take a little change here. I'm gonna let you guys listen to this. Sort of philosophic concept that a sufficiently advanced civilization would be able to create uh, so a, a simulation. Yeah, maybe you've answered this before? A simulation. I've had so many simulation discussions, it's crazy. Okay. So, so the idea is, right, any sufficiently advanced civilization would create, could create a simulation that's like our existence. And so the theory follows that maybe we're in the simulation. Uh, the, 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 I, mean, I think here's, I mean, like the, the, the strongest argument for, for us being a simulation, probably being a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that, that 40, oh, 40, 40 years ago, we had a problem. Like two rectangles and a dot. That was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. We soon we'll have both you know, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in, uh, indistinguishable. Um, even if that rate of investment drops by a thousand from what it is right now, um, then you just say, okay, well, let's imagine it's 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC, whatever, and they would probably be you know, billions of such uh, you know, computers and set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. Tell me what's wrong with that argument. Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably. It's like, is there, is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone, but someone, I'm not sure what error. No, no, the argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it. And this is, and games are the same. No, no, that is a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. okay. All right, so. Uh, to summarize, we didn't quite catch that. Uh, what Elon is talking about is if you look at technological advancement, right? Well, for instance, Moore's Law says that every 18 to 24 months, computer processing power doubles, right? Um, if you look at 
all these devices here, a laptop, a camera, a video camera, a PDA, a watch, Walkman, all of these devices fit in an iPhone 4 from like eight years ago, right? And that's a difference of, what, like 15 years or so? So if you look at the history of humankind, how long humans have been alive, and how long they'll live in the future, it basically says that one of two things will happen. Either human technology will get so good that we can simulate entire universes and worlds as if they're real, like so accurately that they're real, right? Or we just kill each other before our technology gets there. Um, and this was a really well-respected study. So the study says that there's a one in a billion chance that this is actual reality, which is like a point zero 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 one percent chance, right? And it's not, it sounds kind of crazy, like, uh, but if you think about it, humankind, for its history, has most people have believed this is not the main reality, right? So it's not too crazy of a belief, you know, whether that's quantum, whether that's uh, the computers, spiritual. It's a pretty widely held belief, right? So let's also look at graphics, where they've come. If you look up here, the square right up there, well, that was the first game I showed you, the one with four colors. That's the resolution back then. Now, at 4K, we're way over here. And that's just a matter of, you know, about 25 years we've, we've been there, right? So imagine in, in 20 years, in 50 years, where we're going to be. So we're looking at VR a little bit, 1990s. It was really bad in the 1990s. This was the best VR system we had at the time. It had a 60 degree field of view. It's like looking through like a toilet paper roll. You know, you can only see what's right in front of you. The resolution was very low, about the same as an original Nintendo for eye. And 50 milliseconds of latency. That means when I turn my head, 50 milliseconds later, it shows me what I should be seeing. As a result, it's like, hey, you're in virtual reality, except you just had eight chimerinas, right? It's basically an expensive drunk simulator. <laughs> 20 frames a second. I can't even game on that, like on a traditional TV. Um, so let's look at some more 90s VR. This looks like it's from that movie uh, Judge Dredd with Sylvester Stallone. That's the one from the last slide. This looks like Apple and the United Nations came together and created like some kind of VR headset. And, and why is he even looking at this? Like, what are you doing, man? You can't see. You have to take it off your head. That's how it works. This guy has his head in a Korean toilet seat. Go oh, Korea! <laughs> like, I was like, all of Brazil loves Korea now. So. <laughs> uh, this dog is having a good time. He's having some uh, low latency, high resolution experience. So, let's look at VR now. Uh, uh, HTC Vive, which is, you know, one of the two most common headsets. 110 feel, uh, degrees of view. That means you have a little bit of black on the side, so you can see almost everything. The resolution is much better. 22 milliseconds of latency. So when you turn your head, you can't tell that there's a delay. 90 frames a second, and $499. So the price has dropped a lot. Uh, for instance, you guys are probably wondering, you know, here in Brazil, VR is very expensive. Well, in the last two years, VR hardware has halved in price. The computers you need for VR are half in price now. So another three, four years, it's going to get less and less and less expensive and better technology, just like every other event. Okay, why is this bear getting drunk on Jack Daniels whiskey? That's a good question. Uh, so after I moved to, to, to Rio, right, I started prototyping a VR game. Uh, when I was living in Gloria with my friend in Seattle, it was uh, Albert Perez, our co-founder, or one of our co-founders. And we were making this game where you're in a bear, and you're a bartender mixing drinks, you know, serving animals. Like a preguisa would come in all slow. I'd like a red bull and vodka, please. You know, or, or like the gorilla would come in. And the gorilla is happy drunk, but sometimes he's violent and punches people. So it was basically a VR game where you get animals drunk and they just act ridiculous. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why this is not a reality. Well, there's a couple of reasons. First off, our internet, my internet was three megabits down, three megabits per second. This is what I had to deal with. I was, I was on favela net, you know, like in Rio, and it was just horrible, and we couldn't even video conference. Um, but we realized we can make something better than video conferencing. We're doing VR. What if we did VR conferencing? What if we took that immersion that you get in virtual reality and then add more people? You'll feel like you're with them, right? 
and you're not singing video, so the bandwidth usage is very small. So why not do a game? Well, VR install base. If very few people have VR headsets, even if you make the best game ever, there's not enough people to buy it, right? So we had to create a product that people would be willing to buy the hardware to use, right? How do you do that? Well, you need to add value or you need to save the money. If, if someone can spend $1,500 and save $5,000, then they're going to spend that money. And there's also, think about meeting investors. Does so it seem like you have a company, you have to meet with investors, like entrepreneurs here? No, mostly just, okay, a few, cool. Well, when you meet with investors, investors are not game developers, they're a different type, you know? You can say, I've got this VR conferencing software that'll completely change the world. They're like, oh, really cool. Yeah, it'll change education, the way we work together. Oh, very cool. Or you're like, VIE, investor. Mostly both. Abbiamo una come se capivara chi. Giuliano, per favore. Per favore. Che porra è essa? That's the reaction you get when you explain to investors why they should invest in a drug animal game. So we wanted to solve real world problems. Let's look at this problem. Trent Crosby has joined the meeting.
there was actually a study, right? What are people doing during a conference call? And 65% of people on a conference call, a video conference or audio conference call, are doing other work. 63% uh, sending emails, making food, going to the restroom. The fact is, when you're doing a video conference call, you're distracted by everything else outside of that conference call. With virtual reality, you're scrapped in. All you, can ex all you see and experience is what's in VR. You have no outside distractions. That's what makes it such an effective method for conferencing. And why is VR overall better than uh, video conferencing? Like I said, social presence. With good PC VR, if you haven't tried good PC VR, you really haven't tried VR. Because with good PC VR, you actually feel present in a new environment. It's like you've been transported somewhere else. And when you add other people into that environment, you're like, oh, I'm here with Chris, or I'm here with John, whatever. You feel like you're hanging out with them. Eye contact. Have you ever tried to make eye contact with someone in a video conference call? It's impossible. You're either looking at the camera, or you're looking at their eyes. You can't look at both, right? In VR, you can actually make eye contact with everyone. Um, simulate the workplace, you can have a VR workplace. Increase focus, like I said, less, less distractions. Healthier than sitting. While you can sit in VR, uh, I, I do most of my meetings standing just to be a little more active. Um, you can meet in any environment. Uh, if you, want, you don't have to work in a boring office, we're going to have environments like a Japanese temple. You know, any kind of environment that you want to work in, we can create. And of course, you can save money. If you're flying less for meetings, if you're traveling less for work, then you're saving money. Um, so let me see here. Uh, some of the things we can do is, uh, you know, whiteboard, we can share your screen, show images, bring up a PDF. You can ingest 3D models. So if you're teaching a class about anatomy and you're talking about the heart, you can have a 3D model of the heart right here in the room and actually walk around it like you're there. A uh, video player, Google Poly, all kinds of features, right? Um, so, we recently uh, teamed up with Full Sail University in Orlando. They bought about 2,000 licenses from us, and we're turning their online school into a VR experience. It's basically, Ready Player One is already happening in Orlando. Can you play the video for me, please? This was the first class ever. Um, very early, only the teacher had VR in this video. I need to make a new video. But the teacher is in his office at the school teaching, and all of his other students are all over the world, right? They're in a class. And so with VR, uh, when it comes to teaching education, there's a lot of things you can teach better in VR because you have tools that do not exist in real life. If you're teaching 3D vector math or three-dimensional space, you can't teach that easily on a flat screen. But if you're teaching that magnitude. Oh, very loud. Direction and magnitude, my friend. Um, so you can actually draw and circle in space and have a whiteboard that floats around in 3D. Things you can't do in real life, but you can see them do it right here. And so eventually, their entire school, and I believe every online school, is going to be in VR. And it's only going to get better. All right, uh, another cool thing we did, uh, we connected with um, an American uh, TV station, and they brought our software, a v uh, VR set, um, and a satellite internet system to Pimba, Tanzania, a small island off the coast of Tanzania, Africa. These kids had never seen, well, these kids are from Nashville, those are Americans, but the kids in Africa had never seen a laptop before. We put them in virtual reality and connected them to these kids here in Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States. So you have, you know, some of the most remote, uh, poorest children in the world in, in VR with, uh, with uh, kids in America. Very powerful medium. Um, I've been able to live all over the place because I work in VR. My office is in VR. So I lived in Portugal for a while. Um, lived in Sao Paulo, uh, Moema, anyone here near Moema, Brooklyn? I was there for six months. Uh, this is my jiu-jitsu guys in, uh, in Sao Paulo. We would do uh, Friday training, then after VR and beer and samba, good times. Um, lived in Nashville, I'm in Orlando now, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle. So I just move around, I'll get an Airbnb for a month, and now I'm living in a new place and I'm working in VR. Uh, this is not an interesting slide, we're going to skip this one. Uh, and this is... This is... Oh, another... Uh, you're going to skip this too. So I'll leave you guys with one quote before we do questions. 
if you don't trust your employees to work remotely, you shouldn't have hired them in the first place. If you're worried that your employee is going to be at home, not working, slacking off, uh, they're not going to work very hard when they're in an office with you either. So, um, we have some info here, our website, Doghead Simulations. Uh, Ruby is actually free. We just launched on Steam a few days ago. It's free for up to three people. So, if you look for Ruby on Steam or our website, you can get it. Steam is a little better system. I recommend that. Uh, you can follow us, Twitter, our Doghead Twitter, and then my Twitter. Feel free to take a photo. Um, so, I think now we are going to um, do some questions. Get a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you have, uh, if you have a question, uh, you can ask in Portuguese or English. Raise your hand. Se você tem pergunta, você pode perguntar em português também. I hope you understood that. <laughs> I think yes. No. Right here, right here, right here. Okay. Oh, okay. How long does it usually take to get used to the new system? How long does it take to what? To get used to the virtual. Um, the quickest I've seen, like using our software in particular, is like 30 seconds. The longest I've seen is like five minutes. For a, for a team to be completely integrated using it. I mean, as far as like once you've downloaded, and it's, it's like Slack, right? So you uh, create a team, and then you send out invites to different emails. They join your team. Only people in your team can be inside your VR office, right? And so, but if you're using the software for the first time in VR, it just takes minutes to get used to it. There's teleport, and there's select, and a menu button. It's it's more simple than every video conferencing software out there. But yeah, it's it's really easy to get going. É, eu vou perguntar em português, mas você pode responder em inglês tranquilamente. É, queria saber o que, que você acha sobre o desenvolvimento de jogos independentes nos dias de hoje. Você acha que eles estão sendo criativos se você está acompanhando alguma coisa também? É, eu queria saber, é, na sua visão, é, o que, que você está achando sobre a chegada das engines dos jogos como Unity e Unity? Etc. O que, que ele acha sobre os jogos independentes e sobre as engines, a real unit? Um, so indie games, we need indie games because in AAA they can spend maybe a hundred million dollars on one game, right? And if you're spending a hundred million dollars on something, you're not going to take big risks. You're not going to try new things. And so publishers like Activision and EA. They often don't want you to try new things, but indie games might be one, two, three, four, five people, ten. They're trying new things all the time. And so the indie developers are developing the new systems, the new gameplay mechanics, the new ideas, and the AAA games are seeing what works, and they're putting those mechanics and systems in the AAA games. So indie game developers, you guys are like, the researchers, like the scientists of what's fun in games, basically. So it's, indie games are very important. Okay. Uh, I think Mancha will be for me the sound of the drugs, but it's going to be for me. And I did a TCC of a project of reality virtual. Eu queria saber com vocês se você pode me dar uma dica para continuar nessa área, conseguir um trabalho em regimes. So I would suggest you, if you want to make money in virtual reality, um, I would suggest thinking about what can you make that saves other companies money or makes their life easier, right? I know games seem like the fun thing to do right now, and they are, but if you want to potentially make some money, I would say think about what problems in Brazil exist and how can VR help solve those problems. And if you can find a problem and think of how you can solve it with VR, Make that program and then approach these companies, show them what you did, you know. Um, 
you know, I've talked to, I was, I've been in Rio the past uh, three weeks, and I've met with like the bomberos. You know, I've met uh, with people who work in education, with people that work with the police, like all these different areas, and they have all these ideas. Oh, we can do this in VR. We can do that. So find a problem and try to fix it. Você agora pouco mostrou o vídeo da transmissão da, da reunião, né? Eu queria saber o que nesse seu, nessa simulação que você da Dog Head, como vocês evitam todo aquele transtorno que teve no vídeo que vocês mostraram? All right, you're asking about the meeting that you saw in Ruby. Doghead is the name of the company. Rumi is the name of our software. Does that answer? Also, if you're on Steam, we'd love for you to leave us a review because we just launched. We're in the hot trending spot, so if you can keep us there, that'd be awesome. Yes. Um, I mean, I can't go over every every single problem, but uh, for instance, uh, in video conferencing, you talk over other people. I'm talking, then someone else tries to talk, they're like, oh wait, I can't talk now, you know, talking on top of people. Um, the good thing about VR is we're tracking your head and your hands, and so in VR, you have body language. And the thing about body language is your body language tells you so much information, right? So you can see when someone is about to talk. So when I'm like, Hey, you know, you see that, and other people stop talking. Um, the, the feeling of not being mean together. Uh, social presence fixes that. You feel like you're in a room with other people. Um, let me see, uh, I'm trying to think of all the different problems we had. I mean, you still could have a dog at home that could potentially bark. We haven't fixed that. We haven't, we like dogs, so that's okay. Uh, but yeah, if you find me, come talk to me, and we'll talk more about each thing. So I don't want to spend too much time on this question. Next question. Oh. Hi, my name is Paula. I work for a public company. And uh, I see that there are still many people who resist using these, uh, using such technologies. Instead, they prefer to keep a workplace running, spending money on utilities and uh, water and everything. So uh, why are people still so resistant? And how should we contribute to changing this contribute to change this mindset. You know? yeah. There's a couple uh, people that are resistant to VR right now. There's a few reasons. I would say 95% of the time, it's because they did VR on a cell phone or they did VR in a really bad application, right? So VR doesn't, good VR will not make you sick. If you're getting sick, it's either because you're on really bad hardware like a cell phone or the designer designed a really bad program that makes people sick. For instance, if you're on a, you know, like a lot of people say, oh, I tried VR once and it made me sick. Oh, what did you try? Oh, um, it was a roller coaster ride at 20 frames a second on my Samsung Galaxy 6 and I got sick. Well, of course you got sick, right? Um, and I think when people use a good VR experience, they're going to be like, oh, this is different. I actually feel natural here. I feel like I'm actually here. So when people use like... No one has come out of a roomie feeling sick, right? So when they get to use a good experience, then they understand it clicks very quickly. And then they realize that they don't have to sit through Sao Paulo traffic, you know, for an hour each way, or, or the amount of money they spend, you know, or the save not driving or flying to a meeting. It'll make more sense. It's like the early iPhone. Who was like, who needs, who don't need internet on my phone? That's what people were saying. They said, I don't need a phone that has internet and a web browser. That's stupid. Well, everyone has that now. In five years, I bet you in five years almost every online school will be in VR because it's, it's the next best thing to being in person and sometimes it's better than being in person. So. Hi. Uh, I work for the Congress here in Brazil. Are you a congressman? No, no. I'm a journalist. Can you lower the taxes? 
But uh, the question goes in this direction. In a world that we have a kind of a lack of participation, do you believe that game would be used to solve real uh, world problems? Like games in VR? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many like simulation games. Like, for instance, the Germans. You guys love the Germans, right? Uh, the Germans love simulations, right? They will make a simulation game out of being like, I don't know, someone who picks up trash. And they'll be like, Trash Simulator 2018. And like a million Germans will buy it, right? So there's already a lot of simulation games that are teaching people how to do things, right? Um, and I think we'll see more of that in VR because it's so immersive. And people really feel like they're there, and there's so many things you can teach in that environment. Like, for instance, the, the animal, the drunk animal bartending game, bear tending, that they're making. Well, yeah, it's a fun game with crazy animals, but you're learning how to mix drinks. If you order a caipirinha, you have to actually pour the right amount of cachaça, the right amount of uh, limon, you know? So, yeah, for sure, it's going to continue to increase with VR. Yeah, just, sorry. Yeah, and you think about like with multiplayer VR gaming, it's amazing. You feel like you're outside with your friends having fun. And here's something that reminds me of something. A lot of people ask me, is VR going to make us less social? When you're strapped in, you're disconnected. Actually, it's going to do the opposite. Because look, look at social media. Look what social media has done. And I'm not coming down on social media. Every new technology has its bad spots, but social media you think of Facebook, it's actually dehumanized people down to nothing but text. When you're having an argument on Facebook and you're writing stuff and you read other people, you're only getting that text information. You're not getting the nuances of their facial expressions. You're not getting uh, their body language. And so that's why there's so much division in social media. So many people are willing to be hateful and say horrible things. But virtual reality, we're tracking your head and your hands. You have body language. We're starting to regain a lot of the lost characteristics of being a human in VR because now I see your emotions through your body language. And in the next generations of VR, you'll see facial expressions. Um, you'll see eye tracking. So we're basically, we've dehumanized people using social media, but we're rehumanizing them using VR. Hey, Dutch. Uh, vendo essa, essa possibilidade das pessoas hoje em dia nos games, Principalmente da, da, dessa nova geração, você não acha que o, o VR, ele vindo com essa, com essa tecnologia, vai, você acha que evoluindo a tecnologia, as pessoas vão voltar a jogar mais games ou elas vão continuar assistindo mais, que é o que acontece hoje em dia? Okay, so both will exist, like VR will not replace traditional games. But for instance, right now, on an Oculus Go, it's $200, you can actually play a game on Steam in a gigantic movie theater on your $200 headset, streaming through Wi-Fi, right? So you'll, have, you'll actually have people playing traditional games in VR. Um, but think about VR games, right? This is what's going to happen. Think about um, World of Warcraft and MMO. There's a lot of jobs you can do in a role-playing game that's boring right now. If you're a blacksmith, like, it's not very fun selling stuff in an MMO, but in VR, if you're a blacksmith, you take your hammer, and you're actually hammering, you're creating a sword, you're inscribing, you're writing your name on it, you're taking the jewels that you collected off of monsters, and you're putting the jewels inside uh, the, the hold of, of, a, of the sword. You're actually creating something in VR as you're talking to customers. That's going to be amazing. It's not even killing monsters. There's going to be a whole entire uh, huge groups of people that don't even kill things in VR. They're just going to have shops and socialize and talk to people. Boa noite. É, a minha pergunta é, é baseada na questão... Uma reunião, ela costuma durar muito tempo, certo? E quanto tempo uma pessoa poderia é, usar de forma contínua sem dar aquela sensação de enjoo, aquela... Aquele, que ele fica com aquele mal-estar que ele se sente e também aquelas pessoas que têm problemas de vista, né, que usam óculos, como que elas ficariam bem utilizando o VR, assim? So it depends on the VR program or experience. Um, 
we often, every week, we have meetings in VR that are an hour or an hour and a half, right? Every week, uh, no problems. I've had, a, we've had, I think, two, two and a half hour meetings, and I haven't had a problem. It depends on the person. Like for me, you know, I have, I'm a pretty big guy, so I don't feel a lot of weight on my head. Um, so it depends. Like I said, most people in our software can stay an hour and a half without any problem, two hours. And that number is just going to go up. It's going to be more and more comfortable. Um, so yeah, it depends on the program, but for Rumi, I'd say easily two hours uh, for most people if they have a good headset. Uh, I would like to ask two questions, actually. Uh, first question is, who will be able to be at a conference on Rumi? I mean, only people who own a VR will be able, or uh, people at smartphones or screen, flat screens will be able to meet each other as well. Good question. Um, you don't have to have VR hardware to use Rumi. We realize not everyone has VR hardware, most people do not. And most of our current users are not using VR hardware. So you can use just WASD and, and, and mouse, you know, keyboard and mouse, just like you're playing Counter-Strike, Call of Duty, and you can use a uh, VR meeting like that. And that's how a lot of people do it. So as time goes on, more and more people will have the hardware, and it'll be more immersive for them. Okay, uh, second question is, have you ever developed a game on VR that is already available to play, like we can download it or something? Nothing that's available to play, just the prototype for Bantam VR, which was never finished. But I want to I make a VR game sometime in the future, which just now is not the right time. Here. Where? Here. Where? Okay. Wait, where? Oh, okay. I'm hearing the speaker. Hi, uh, sorry about my English, but I think... Yeah, sorry about my Portuguese <laughs> words. My name is Joshua, and I want to know if you do you think that the VR experience can be used in other areas like medicine uh, and be 100% efficient with, without difference of the reality in our near future? Yeah, there's actually um, been a study. If you give me your email, I can send it to you. Um, that VR killed or like stopped 50% of pain. In in hospital patients. So they, they let people, you know, you know, write down how bad their pain was, one to ten, then they put them in VR and in a cool experience, and they just forgot about the pain. So the, the VR actually distracts them from pain. And so we're gonna see a lot of these all-in-one VR systems in hospitals. For me, like if I give blood, if I you know they take my blood, I donate blood, I'll pass out, right? Um, so what I'm gonna try next time see if I can not pass out is I want to get an Oculus Go and do some kind of crazy experience while they're draining my life force. Something like Black Mirror. <laughs> yeah, something like Black Mirror, basically. It's most of Black Mirror is true or going to be true. Okay, thank you.
haptics, like physical objects that we use to play. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about haptics, which are the physical things, right? Like when you have a controller and it shakes, you know, that's one way to experience the game. Um, for VR, uh, pretty soon we'll have eye tracking. So there'll be a camera that looks at where your eye is, right? So if you're in a meeting, you'll know exactly where people are looking. Um, it'll add a lot of emotion. Uh, we're seeing these like gun type things that actually force feedback when you fire. You know, um, I think the more common haptics we'll see is just more tracking, so that you know where your feet are, where your knees are, so you get more body motion. Um, is that, I don't know if that's answering, I think it is. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Yeah, the thing is, people can develop games for this hardware. But if it's expensive and very few people have it, they're not going to develop for it. You know, I'm not going to make a game for a video game console that's owned by 5,000 people because I might only sell 50 copies, right? So it has to be a standard piece of hardware, something that a lot of people have for people to develop for. It. You know, like a lot of people have a headset and a lot of people are tracking the hands, but not a lot of people are tracking the feet. So. Next. Uh, we're finished, okay. Wait. Oh, big selfie, sweet. Everyone stand up, Levin Todd. Both of all.